Welcome back to the Cross Border Interviews. I'm your host, Chris Brown, and it is another great episode of the Cross Border Interviews. Today, we are sitting down with the MLA for, I want to get this right, Spruce Grove, Stony Plain, because I kept on saying it wrong every time I tried to do this pre-interview. Um, MLA for Spruce Grove, Stony Plain, Searle Turton. Searle, welcome to the show. Awesome. Thanks, Chris. Excited to be here. So before we get started into the nitty gritty of who you are, I have asked this question to every guest uh, on this show, and you're no exception. Searle, where'd your sense of duty to serve come from? Um, where's my sense of duty? You know, I've always been interested in politics and, and governance, you know. Um, I mean, if you would have asked me at 10, 11 years old what I wanted to do when I, when I, you know, for a job, I probably would have been a nerd instead of politician. I just loved government and politics all through school. I loved debating in social studies class, but probably the main reason why I jumped in in 2010 on city council was that I wanted to build a splash park uh, here in Spruce Grove. I was upset that a lot of other communities didn't, you know, they had these elaborate splash parks that families could enjoy. I had a young son at the time who is three or four. I'm like, why doesn't Spruce Grove have one? So that was actually the, the key reason why I wanted to run back then. And obviously I was pretty happy that we were able to get that splash park built about four years later, one of the biggest in the capital region. So, but um, yeah, it's been politics and, and just wanting to serve that way has been running through my blood for many, many years. Was politics discussed at the family table as a child growing up or were you sort of the odd one out like myself and politics kind of was the thing that you wanted to talk about, but no one else in the family wanted to? It was always talked about. Like all the things you're not supposed to talk about at the kitchen table, we we talked. We talked religion. We talked politics. It was a very opinionated household and I probably... Uh, uh, we had a, a good family friend of ours growing up that I really idolized. Uh, our local MLA, he was a, a bit of a family friend. And I remember just like thinking, wow, that's awesome. I remember being in grade six, going to the legislature in Saskatchewan and having him there. And and I thought it was so cool. Like I was like, hey, hi, Mr. McLaren. And he's like, it was just kind of weird because I was trying to act cool around him. But I'm like, I know who he is. And I just remember thinking how awesome that would be if I was able to represent the area. So yeah, it's been, like I said, it's been running through my blood for a very long time. I'm truly uh, living my passion, which I appreciate. So what happened in 2010? Because you, you don't get into politics until 2010. Yes, I'm assuming you helped out volunteering, but you also helped out on political campaigns, I'm assuming, like I did growing up. What happened in 2010 that made that switch? You talk about that splash park, but there must have been something else that said, you know what, this is the year. 2010, I'm going to run for city council as a city councillor for Spruce Grove. Well, yeah, absolutely. So all through my 20s, um, I had helped out on campaigns all through Edmonton and, you know, the Spruce and Stony. And I remember it was just, I was about 30 at the time. And I remember just having that real gut check. You look at yourself in the mirror kind of deal. It's like, why not now? Why not me? Like I've been in this, you know, volunteering and passionate about it. Why not, you know, have my voice heard on city council? There was only one other younger individual um, that was on council at the time. It was a, a very, we'll call it experienced council. And I just wanted to bring a different perspective of young families and kids and and, uh, you know, having about 10 campaigns worth of experience prior to myself running, um, I utilized all those skills and techniques and tactics. And, and uh, I think I came second out of 12 candidates in that one election. So I really came out of nowhere. And um, obviously, I've been serving ever since. So but I, it's, I, I think with most leaders, you kind of have that gut check you know, that m and moment, one shot, one opportunity. And, and I actually thought I was going to lose that first election because it's very tough to kind of break in on the first time and very thankful that I was able to win that first election that I tried. tried Particularly out. municipal politics, it's always hard to break it as an, as an unknown, but also going up against an established incumbency. Um, I want to go back to that very first election in 2010 here. Because you always remember your first time, right? You always remember the first time you walk in, you see your name on the ballot, you see your name on the signs. What was that experience like for you going into that ballot box, being someone who has been active in politics for so long, seeing your name and being able to put a check mark or an X beside your name and saying, you know what, at least I got one vote. Well, it was, uh, 
it, it was different, kind of surreal because when you start seeing the signs go out and you're door knocking, it, it, it kind of felt a little bit like imposter syndrome in a ways, like, like, do I deserve to be here? And even at every step where I was doing extremely well, I still felt like, um, like, like, should I be here? And I, I'll, I'll never forget. It was the last night or the second last night of the campaign. And I only really figured I might win with like a couple days left, you know, um, because I was always, you know, going to be like a hundred votes behind. And so I remember um, I, I was actually at the, at the local liquor store. I'm grabbing a couple of cases of beer, you know, getting ready for election night and I'm my brains in a fog and I'm not thinking. And I remember I'm just at the cashier and I'm just like paying. And the lady looked at my, my air miles card and she says, Cyril Turner, are you like a realtor or something? Because she had recognized my name. And I'm like, no, but that's awesome. Like just someone new that just had seen hundreds of my signs all over the city that recognized it. And I'm like, man, this may actually happen. And like 48 hours later, I was second out of, like I said, 12 candidates. And absolutely, I'll never forget like being in the hallway in my house where I was just like looking at the computer for the poll data. And when all of a sudden the last poll came in, I had won and my good friend, Dave, he calls up and, and I saw, and my phone started lighting up, but he was the first phone call. And I picked up the phone and he says, congratulations, counselor turn. And I actually started crying. And actually right now, even just thinking what that feeling was like to actually have a chance to live my dream and, and serve like I was a pretty emotional phone call and then obviously it was the rest is history so the moment you get elected is a joyous one you just said you're tearing up even thinking about it when does that emotion go to oh crap what have I gotten into because the moment you step into that council chambers or on the legislative floor which we're going to talk about in a few minutes you have a weight and responsibility put on your shoulders to make sure that your decisions that you make are going to best reflect the wants and needs of your community, but also the decisions you make are going to affect your neighbors, your family members, uh, taxes, your their income. So how much of a weight and responsibility was put on you the moment after that joy sort of came down after that election, first election? So, so there was a couple points. So coming in, so they, I was the new guy and everyone was trying to figure me out. And I remember um, then my naivety on so many aspects. So I remember um, it was a municipal elections are in October and uh, like everyone, I had all these ideas, right? And so, and they knew I door knocked every house in the city. And I remember I had a, a bunch of ideas about snow removal, like, oh, we're doing it all wrong kind of deal. And I remember the city manager, Doug McGore, one of the grizzled veterans at the time, he set me up with um, the GM for, for snow removal, that they're going to make sure this council gets all the information he wants. So I'll never forget, his name was David Hales. He's now with the city of Edmonton. But he, you know, sat down and said, oh, I hear you have some questions about snow removal. And I laid out my entire strategy about snow removal. I have no experience in snow removal. I was in construction. I was in other things. But I had all the answers figured out. And I remember him nodding politely. And, and when I was done, he says, okay. And he reached over and he grabbed a 160 page document and he put it down written by engineering firms and everything about the science of snow removal, that the sidewalk has to be four and a half feet from the street because on an accumulated snowfall, when it gets scooped off the road, it gets put onto that that storage area and it can go up to about three feet up before the 45 degree angle hits the side. It was down to such a science in terms of every aspect of snow removal. And my mind is going foggy with the numbers and the graphs and engineering and climatologists. And, and then I'm like, okay, well, as you were continue on. Like it was just the difference between having an opinion on the outside and then you truly have some amazing public service that there is science and justification about why you know the um, governments make these you know um make these policy changes and, and another time when it really hit home about the impact that was having it was a couple just after the budget so i'm about a month and a half in and um my wife she was she's doing the bill she's opening them up and she says oh like the water bill like it went up and then i remember she just says well you can't do nothing about it anyways one of those comments and i remember i stopped and i was like actually, I voted for the increase for the water bill. 
And she says, what? And I'm like, well, you know, like, but that was when it hit home. Like that just an innocuous little comment. Like you can't do nothing about it anyways. I'm like, I actually put that increase in there to pay for the new water reservoir. So, I mean, it's, it's been a journey. And after three terms, I became kind of like the grizzled veteran on, on council. I mean, we had new counselors come in and I became old man Turton. And then obviously I was able to carry that, I think, respect for the public service and understanding political process when I went to the next stage, which was obviously uh, the legislature. So, Which is where we're going to turn the story now, because all this week we're talking to municipal councillors who took a turn in provincial. So on Monday we talked to Bill Purdy. Tuesday we talked to Fred Lindsay. It seems like we're doing the Stony Plain uh, week long series right now, but the best area of the province. <laughs> best area of the province. Um, so you decide in 2019, a year before, year and a half before your term is about to end, you're going to leave municipal politics and try your hand in provincial politics. You were elected in April of 2019. Did you always have that desire to move up to provincial politics? Was that where you want it to be? Or were you comfortable in municipal politics? Because I want to know what makes a municipal politician leave. So a, a great question. So the first two elections that I did in 2010 and 13, um, I remember when I would go door to door, door to door, when I would chat with people, they'd say, oh, sir, we need a new rec center or we need a new sidewalk or new, all these municipal issues, which was great. But when I ran for my third term in 2017, I would go to the door and they'd say, you know, I'd say, oh, I'm running for city council. I'm like, yeah, yeah, you know, but um, that's fine. You know, whatever about the municipal, but my husband just lost her job out of the power plants. What are you going to do about it? Or, you know, my kids can't find jobs or why hasn't the Stony Plain hospital been expanded? And it was every house was provincial issue after provincial issue. I'm like, no, I'm, I'm here to talk about municipal and I, I kept getting sucked into all these provincial issues to a much greater extent than I did the other two elections. And so, you know, after, you know, I was elected that time, it was kind of another bit of a navel gazing. I'm like, man, like our area is hurting on the provincial side. There was a real appetite for a change of direction at that time. And so um, shortly after that election, I think it was about four months or so, I announced I was going to run for the nomination uh, for obviously the, the UCP at that point. And then uh, that took about a 10 month process to kind of do. And then obviously I ran in the provincial election um, and then it kind of took it from there. But, uh, you know, I, I would never have got that conversation if I didn't or hadn't visited thousands and thousands of houses like I, I typically did. And when you hear the same message over and over again, it was, I remember coming home and talking to my wife. I'm like, something's not right. Like in terms of, the, the flavor and what I'm hearing at the doors. And she says, well, just keep going through it. You'll, you'll, you'll follow, you'll, you'll make the right decision. And so, but that was really what kind of pushed me over the edge. I want to know from your perspective, what was the difference that you found in municipal politics heading into provincial politics? Because provincial politics is partisan. You are a party man, you are a party label, where municipal, you are independent. Yes, you can have some backers who are conservatives or NDP or liberals or what else, so on and so forth. But when you're in a partisan politics like provincial or federal, it's a completely different game. So for you, were you prepared for the more partisanship of that campaign where you're either blue or orange or green or red or purple or whatever color you were? I'm prepared. I think I logically was prepared, maybe emotionally wasn't as prepared. So there are some pretty fundamental differences. Like I love the pragmatism at uh, local government where I could vote with one person on one side of the spectrum on one issue, vote with someone on the other side of the issue. Uh, or on the other side of the spectrum on another one. And, and you could flip flop like that and just kind of follow your gut. Um, provincial, oh, I guess also the thing on municipal is I remember my most passionate speeches and actually swaying the discussion, having other counselors say, Searle, that was a point we never thought about and you swayed me. And having your mind truly open up until the final decision about which way you're gonna go. And so for me, it was, you know, coming from background of sales as well. It was like, how do I craft this in a way that would be well received? How do I pre-package it with my counselor colleagues and make sure that they can um, better digest it? And unfortunately, I think there's just more so instead of 
um, debate. There's more posturing a lot of times in the chamber, which I find quite boring because I want to have actual constructive dialogue. And I find in, at least in legislative committees, it does uh, tend to go more towards constructive dialogue. Um, so I the find stuff no one watches is what you're saying. The stuff that no one watches except question period. Yeah. And you know what? I remember I was in one um, committee and we had to go into closed session and it was bipartisan. We had members of the opposition there as well. And then it's like, as soon as he said, and cameras are off, it became just the most normal conversation, constructive, like, it was just like, like nine of us sitting around, hey, what about this? What about that? And actually just, it reminded me of council. I even made that, that conversation. Like I, I said, I sure hope this level of congeniality can occur in question period, in, which is happening in two hours. And then everyone laughed. And then the cameras went on and it was fine. But then question period, everyone was like, ah, like just, and they were just, made it I, I think social media and the and the and the quips of the 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 sound bite the gotcha moments I think that truly has taken away from sound governance and decision making it's just you know unfortunate just with the times how did your time as a municipal councillor prepare you for this new role that you're currently in as an MLA because you I I, I, I want to get to the idea of do municipal politicians make good provincial politicians because of their background? Because we have people who come in who don't have any governance background, but do you believe that your background in municipal politics prepared you a little bit better than say some of your other colleagues or some other people in the past to do the job as MLA better? Or no? I, I would think so. Like I'd actually unequivocally say so. I, I think, you know, for new councillors coming in, uh, I think it's part of the nature of municipal government. It's, pounded literally pounded into their heads about you are here for governance the administration is there to run the actual municipality you are strictly governance and the ceos and the general managers especially with the larger communities it's it's very structured and i remember that was pounded we went through orientation sessions with consultants they gave us books to read there was real strong trying to train the new counselors coming in about their role that same process did not exist on the provincial level. Like I, I understood clearly the differences between governance and policy and, and administrative and the bureaucracy and things like that. And I think a lot of MLAs coming in, they don't. I mean, I went for eight and a half years on municipal council and never went mentioned the word ideology once, like in any speech. And trust me, I was a, a, one of the louder guys in council. And I think at the higher levels, um, ideology is used as a crutch by many individuals on all sides of the spectrum as a way to justify why they're doing things. I, I do think there's a fundamental difference between municipal politicians going up to provincial, perhaps maybe versus federal going to provincial, because I think the municipal politicians, they're just a lot more pragmatic. I, I guess I'm slightly biased, but in terms of let's, let's just get the job done and they bring that spirit into provincial politics where at the federal level, it's so big. And you talk about conservatism and liberalism and post, you know, modernism. And like you can say a speech using that type of terminology and flavor at the federal level and no one would even bat an eye. And then you see federal officials coming down and they almost bring that ideological perspective to the provincial level. It's very telling to see the differences between that obviously we had federal politicians come down from the federal level to the provincial level where I saw it firsthand. I want to, I asked you about that moment, that first election in 2010. So I'm going to ask you the follow-up question about the election in 2019. That moment that that check mark is put beside your name and you are elected as MLA elect Turton instead of now counselor Turton, your MLA elect Turton. What was that moment like for yourself? I mean, it was, it was emotional, um, obviously excited about the next stage. It, it's kind of a little anticlimactic. Like it was exciting for the night, but when the check mark happens and then the next days, like the phone calls, like, what do you, what does this next step look like? They're like, okay, well, um, we'll see you in a month. Like that, that was the kind of period it was because there was weeks of the executive had to get set up and things like that. So after you clean up your signs, I remember you had campaigned so hard to get it. And then all of a sudden you get it. And they're like, yeah, nothing happens for another couple of weeks. See, ya. like, it was just like, I was like, do I do yard work? Like I, it was the weirdest 
thing, right? Because you don't have access to your office, you don't have access to emails, you don't have access to the ledge or try, everything is trying to get set up. But it was, um, but I mean, when we got to the legislature, that was pretty cool. Like I remember my wife and I, we went there for the very first time and they had like security guards at all the entranceways because they say you have to come in because you don't have a pass even a parking pass like how do you know where to go and they told us where to go and and so literally at every corner there was someone oh mla turton you go this way and i remember asking like how do you know who i am and i didn't realize this they said oh we had flashcards so all the staff at the legislature had flashcards about all the mlas because they had to know their faces and they would test each other for weeks so Every person I went to, they're like, oh, hello, Emily Turton, nice to see you. And they would guide me to where, what room I had to go in, which was kind of cool. But um, I guess when we got into the constituency part of the business, um, I had a real big humbling session. Because if someone would have told me when I was in city council, oh, you don't really know Spruce Grove, I legitimately would have been insulted. I mean, I graduated from high school here. I've been married here. I'm raising my kids here. I was on council. I volunteer. I know this community intimately. How dare you say I don't know this community? But after about six months, I truly had to admit that I didn't know my community. Because as an MLA, you see parts of the place that I call home that I never saw before. When I was on council, I logically knew that there was an FCSS um, department that took care of supports for, for families that needed help. But it was like very arm's length. And as the MLA, we had people actually walking in saying, we need help filling out this ACE application. And my staff are trying to take care of it. And it was, I was truly exposed to whole parts of the community that I was maybe I'm not privileged enough. Like, I, I didn't, I wasn't aware of it logically, yes, but not emotionally invested in making sure these people were looked after. And, it was a humbling experience like, wow, like there's a lot about this area that I don't know about that, you know, um, like I never walked through the homeless shelters and understood like where, like, why are you here? What's your story? And hearing those and, and um, that, that was a bit of a humbling session in terms of what that was like for the first couple months. Was it infuriating about the speed of government as well? Because as a municipal councillor, I worked in municipal politics for a while, and I can tell you that if a council wants something done, they have a they have a council meeting and they can make a unanimous you know, motion and get uh, administration on top of it. Where provincial politics may take a little bit longer because you have bills, you have committee hearings, and things don't go at the same speed. So, from a, your municipal experience to that provincial, was that a hard thing to try to understand that? life is not municipal politics anymore it is we're going to study after study and maybe we're going to restudy the first study of the study of the study and it's just it's infuriating yeah. because you want things to change you want to better the community that you live in but also your province but it's not going to go at the speed that you want it to yeah absolutely so the you know municipal land you have the administration that kind of acts as the bastion of support and stability that they're there even if the councils come and go when i was first elected in 2010 i think i was uh one the only new counselor one or two new counselors out of seven that were on council so it was a very stable relationship but when you come into provincial politics when i won in 2019 um new cabinet new premier new party new everything and even a lot of the the policy people that were with the previous government weren't there. So it's like starting fresh. And so I know when I when it was first elected, I'm like, okay, I know how this works. I know how to lobby things. I have my ideas. And I was going to the different ministries trying to figure out how what's the flavor, how do I push stuff? And a lot of the people I was dealing with were also trying to figure that out. So I wasn't really thinking or acknowledging that, you know what, the, the whole bureaucracy that I have to work with is still trying to figure out as well. And so um, which is, I guess, new when any time you have a new government change in, but, but you are correct. I mean, in terms of the pace of decision-making on the provincial level, it is a slow machine to get moving. I mean, when it does get moving, you have the torque of an entire provincial bureaucracy and billions of dollars potentially at your disposal. Like there's a lot of horsepower there. It just takes a long time to get that engine going in that direction. And so I, I found 
uh, how I dealt with my millions of issues as a municipal counselor. I could be a, a bit of a scalpel where I have an issue. I go in, let's focus on this and get taken care of. Because of the speed of decision making, I almost had to get 12 snowballs of different ideas rolling down the hill, not sure which one was going to fall. And you kind of had to be a little bit more dispersed because um, to try to get that. And it was just a different way to how to approach problems uh, working with the different ministries. Oh, you're on mute. You're probably I, saying. I apologize. I said something amazing there and I was on mute because I took a sip of water and I forgot to unmute myself. But I want to turn to your time as MLA because I am cautious of time yep. here and we have about 10 minutes before we have to wrap up. And I want to ask this question. You have had three years under your belt. You're heading into an election in a few months as of airing this in January. Um, Is there Election coming? Oh, just I, the, that's what the polls are saying, and that's what I'll, everyone's telling me. I'll, I'll have to take a note of that. So. Exactly, that's that's what the Twitter people are telling me. Um, yes. Looking back on your three years in office so far, and you're not done yet three and over three and a half years. What's been the highlight for you? What's the one moment you can say, you know what? Even if I'm not reelected in May, I can point to this moment in time and say, I made Alberta better or I made my riding, my constituents better because I was here and I voted for this or I pushed this bill forward. Probably um, if, if you put a gun to my head uh, and, and ask me a question, would probably have to be my motion 501. And I remember my first meeting after elected, I met with the premier. And, uh, you know, Jason asked me, he says, so oh, he says, why are you here? And I said, well, just to let you know, Premier, that, um, you know, adoption is very near and dear to my heart. I adopted my youngest. I want to make adoption easier for families so that other families don't have to go through what we did when they just simply want to increase their family and give kids a forever home. And he says, oh, that's awesome. You know, and, and um, you know, I remember two weeks later, I got a note. They're saying, oh, you've been, you're, dr you're the first person under 501, motion 501. Uh, to do a motion. I'm like, that's fantastic. What's a motion? And there's a, they had to literally explain the process. And so I put forth the very first motion at, in 2019, um, something along the lines of urging the Alberta government to make adoption easier for families and for the betterment of children. And, and um, you know, for three and a half years, I've been working with different children's services ministers. I think we're going to make some, um, we've made some good progress in that regard. But that is the one thing, just knowing that because of my own initiative that we're able to make Alberta a better place for kids to find forever families. Um, that, that is going to be something I'm going to be bragging about in the seniors home because I think it made a difference. So. You, you talk about uh, how you've worked through three years of getting this done and hopefully getting uh, some families connected with their forever children, but expanding their forever families as well. Why, why was this important to you? Because you know what? My family, my my husband and I are looking at the adoption route right now because it's one of those things where we're time's ticking and with every all the medical issues that are going on with me, I, it's unfortunate that we're unable to do that right now. But why was this such an important thing for you? Was there a moment in your past that you went, you know what, while you were going through the adoption process, you went, you know what, this is too burdensome for a simple, not a simple process, but a process like this where we are connecting kids with a loving, nurturing family that wants them and wants to help them. Yeah, I mean, like personally, I mean, we had um, our, our goal was always to have, you know, adopted kids. Uh, our original plan was to have two kids and an adopted third. We had our first son. We're like, ah, oh, we know how this works out. Oh, we'll have a second child and it didn't work out. Um, for medical reasons and all the rest of it. So we're like, let's, let's adopt. And I remember when we started that process, it took us almost four or five years to kind of get through, like from the time we signed the paperwork to when we had a child. And I remember just seared into my soul, my youngest, my son at the time was like, why can't I have a brother and sister like everyone else? And, um, you know, and I'm so thankful that we were able to finally adopt a, a small baby boy from, from Florida. But I mean, just knowing how much money it costs and time, um, I always, like I told the premier in that first meeting, I want to make sure that other families don't have to go through these challenges that we did. And I think we've made some significant steps up for it. And, and um, I, just knowing that we'll make it easier for families like, like yours, for example, to be able to 
maybe get past some of the hurdles that I know. Like the last thing, the, the worst thing I remember is families telling me saying, you know, uh, we were on the list for two years and we just gave up. And to know that the despair that that family and that couple has to go through because he gave up and I'm not faulting them because the system was flawed, but knowing that there's a, a kid out there that just needs a, you know, loving parents, a couple of you know, parents that just want to simply increase their family and to know that I kind of helped move the bar that direction. Um, again, that, that was pretty emotional. So. I want to turn to my last uh, question here, Cyril, and then I'm going to wrap it up. And that is, You've had an extensive career in politics. Looking back on your time in office so far, whether it be municipal or provincial, what's been the highlight? Has it been the municipal aspect or has, has it been the provincial or is it like choosing your favorite child? You just can't. Um, my, my favorite highlight. I mean, obviously the Splash Park, like as a central part, I know it, it sounds silly, but just being able to go there and see so many families uh, spending time with their kids in a free environment. Like that was, that was a big accomplishment for me. The adoption part was obviously pretty emotional. Um, being able to kind of carry some of my passions for municipal government into provincial politics. So my second motion that I was given the privilege to be able to do was putting forth EPR, which actually was the largest wholesale change of Alberta's recycling that we've had in decades. And to be able to say, as a lowly member, I brought this to the forefront and and uh, our environment is going to be better off because of it. So those would be some of the highlights in terms of initiatives. I know I'm generally regarded as the um, one of the adults in the room. Like when, when, like we've had some contentious issues over the last couple of years. I mean, we dealt with COVID and energy crashes and the rest of it. And uh, I, I do try to be the, the reasonable one, like, okay, let's just kind of settle her down. Let's talk about this and, and uh, you know, old man turton wisdom, right? Because I mean, I'm coming up to 13 years of, of this kind of stuff. And when you have a, a, a lot of MLAs, for example, that when they were elected, they had 14 communities, 14 mayors, seven school boards, six, you know, chambers of commerce that they were literally meeting for the very first time and trying to figure out how to be a public servant in their area. For me, I knew my chambers of commerce, my trustees, my mayors. My, so I knew the community and the community knew me. So we were able to jump to the advanced class right off the bat and really be a lot more aggressive with pushing some of these ideas. Because while some MLAs might have been trying to meet their mayors for the first time, I mean, I had Nerf gun fights with the mayor of Stony Plain in my house for years already. So I had that experience that maybe a lot of other councillors or, or MLAs didn't have already with that history. And so, um, but um, yeah, it, my, my journey isn't done yet. I mean, I do plan on running in the upcoming election. And uh, why, we'll why, why should the people of your riding give you another term? What, 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 what do you want to tell them right now for those who might be listening and saying, you know what? Maybe I should give Cyril another year kick at the can here because he was such a great guy in the first four years. I think, you know, a key reason why I think people should, you know, look at me seriously is that they know I bleed community. They know I bleed this area. I, uh, you know, I do my best to support businesses. This is home. And I want to make sure that obviously I bring a respectful tone, you know, and discourse to the position. I know that maybe some elected officials like to go a little bit more partisan-ish, um, a little bit more of the posturing, but I know for myself, uh, I realize that there's a story behind every person, regardless of what political party you have. And so I do try to be respectful. I'm known as uh, one of the respectful, one of the good guys per se. And I know my time in politics will eventually end. I'm under no illusions about that, but my goal is, is that if I'm at Safeway or the local leisure center and someone can come up to me and say, you know, sir, we didn't vote for you, but thank you for being a solid representative for our community. At the end of the day, that's all I can ask for. So that's why I'm, I'm there. I want this area to be an incredible place for people to call home. And I want to do everything in my power to make sure that uh, those dreams for the many of the families here can be realized. Well, sir, I want to thank you so much for sitting down for this last half hour and chatting about yourself, chatting about your time in municipal and provincial politics. Uh, I look forward to seeing what happens in a few months time with you, but also I look forward to seeing what happens in this province as well. So thank you so much for doing this. It's been an honor of my lifetime to have you on the show. Awesome. Thank you so much, Chris. It was a pleasure to be here today. 
So with that, I want to remind everyone, put down Twitter, put down social media, and go have a conversation with somebody. It helps our society, it help helps our democracy, and it helps us be a better people at the end of the day. So with that, this has been the Cross Border Interviews with Chris Brown. Have yourself an excellent day. And remember, everyone, just keep talking. <laughs>